Insurance premiums are paid. Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready. Got my medical insurance card on me. What's going on? You're watching USG Hot Takes. I'm your host, A.T. Bianco, and I'm very excited to announce today's guest. It's the interim president of Stony Brook University, Dr. Michael Bernstein. Shake your hand right across the table. Thanks Good for being here with us today. I Good appreciate to it. Thanks for having me. So um, to start, before we start, tell us your experience with hot foods and whether or not you like them or you don't like them. I do like spicy foods, although okay. I understand this may be an order of magnitude different yes. than what I'm used to. But mm -hmm. I, I enjoy spicy cuisine, uh, Mexican food, Asian food, you know, so I, I've enjoyed that in the past. I hope I'll enjoy it today. All right. So are you ready to get into the first <laughs> I, I, sauce? I am. I okay. Am. So the first sauce is called the hot one sauce. Okay. What we're going to do, we're going to clink wings, cheers, and we'll get into the, into the first question, all right? Okay. So cheers, cheers to you. Toss it right on in here. Not that bad, got a little sweet taste to it, you know? So we'll get right into it. Um, I wanna do some time travel. <laughs> Back, uh, backtrack to Michael Bernstein as a college student, as a young professional. It's a long time ago. If you can go back that far. <laughs> What was your personal experience like and how has that shaped the, the man you are today? My personal experience in college itself? In college and going right into the work world even. Yeah. Um, so, you know, college was a pretty intense experience for me. I mean, I found, I found college challenging. I had to work pretty hard mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I enjoyed college, uh, generally speaking. And I think when I reflect back on my college years and initially getting to graduate school and starting work, it was all about mentors. I had good people in my life, both teachers and uh, uh, you know professional guides, and also in my family who gave me great advice and were always there for me when I had questions. I mean, I reflect on that a lot to this day. Where did you attend undergrad? I was an undergraduate at Yale. Okay. Um, I, I graduated, I went overseas for a year. I actually studied at the University of Cambridge for a year in England. Great experience, but it was my first opportunity to travel. Okay, so both undergrad and graduate school at Yale, what, were, what was your area of uh, study and expertise? So I was an economics major. Okay. I was an undergrad, I minored in history. Um, and uh, then when I went on to graduate school, I actually chose economics as, as my graduate school field, mm -hmm. although I remained very interested in history and actually did a lot of work in economic history. And that's, you know, most of my economic history work has been focused on the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Starting in graduate school, I was particularly interested to study the Great Depression of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Um, it's obviously a major episode right. in world history, um, but also it was the period in which my parents grew up. My parents were youngsters mm -hmm. when the Great Depression started, so I heard a lot about it growing up and obviously framed their lives, and it led to World War II, which mm -hmm. also framed their lives. So uh, in certain ways, a lot of my research, and it's the research on the 1930s that matters to me the most in many respects, you know, is also a way of connecting with my parents in some respects. That's really interesting to hear. Um, what kind of stories, I guess, did you hear from your parents well, that resonated with you? Well, you know, first, you you know, anyone who lived through the 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly my parents who at the time were, you know, 10 years old at, in the worst years of the, mm -hmm. in the worst years of the Depression, you know, what framed their memories was the hardship around them. My, my grandfathers were both school teachers, uh, my mother's father and my father's father. They were both high school teachers in New York City, so they were actually fortunate because mm. they kept their jobs. Okay. Um, but everyone around them was losing their jobs, and I think that's what you know affected my parents uh, profoundly. Their friends, you know, were in households that were suddenly quite challenged and compromised by you know breadwinners out of work, and there was a lot of hardship. Uh, you know, homelessness, people living in the streets, uh, people, uh, you know, either begging for money or taking up op jobs just to pick up some money. And then, of course, World War II started. So oh, for okay. my father in particular, World War II interrupted college. He, 
he went into the Navy. I mean, that happened to an entire generation, mm -hmm. obviously. So that's another impact, I think, on that generation of not taking anything for granted and understanding that things can change right. very quickly. Taking stock of opportunities. Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have the opportunity to go to college, you better make the best of it. You're right. going to have the opportunity to you know, train for a career, make the best of it. Um, but all, but all very positive. I don't mean to say that it was all, mm -hmm. you know, negative. You know, my, my grandfathers were both, you know, very loving men who were, were optimists, basically, and were eager, obviously, to see their children, my father and mother, flourish and, and, their, and their grandchildren. I was, I was very fortunate in that regard. So, cheers. Cheers. All right, Let's one try this one, yeah. Hmm. It's unique. It's kind of got a little like tangy taste to it. Yeah, the little it, blueberry you know? taste. Yeah. That is unique. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. You joined Stony Brook back in 2016. Correct. Yep. And um, you were the provost and senior vice president for academic affairs. What did you learn in that role these past three years? Great question. Uh, I learned, first of all, about the uniqueness of this institution. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it's a very special place, a, a very you know, high-toned, high-performing, excellent research university that at the same time serves an incredibly diverse student population that performs at a very high level, that mm -hmm. graduates at very high rates, that succeeds in, you know, very powerful ways. You can't say that about a lot of leading research universities in this country. So that, I was struck by that right away. Obviously, at our university, we have our disputes about many things. I've been involved in those disputes mm -hmm. over the years. Sometimes those arguments can get pretty intense. But when you talk about the students here and their accomplishments and when you talk about the faculty and their research or mm -hmm. their work, people sort of come together around that. You know, it's like like you're in a room with lots of voices and suddenly when you say, oh, but what about the students? Right. What about the faculty? Everybody sort of gets quiet and says, yeah. Oh, that's why we're here. Yeah, yeah, that's, and, yeah. and everybody sort of coheres around that. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful thing. Um, the other lesson... Uh, I learned in the provost's office and that I carry with me always, you know, one of the big responsibilities of the provost and, and the provost team is to manage resources, manage budgets in all mm -hmm. the colleges and schools. That's a complicated task. There are a lot of people in the provost's office who work really, really hard at doing that. They taught me a lot about how we sort of get on top of our budgets, mm -hmm. understand them, manage them mm -hmm. uh, and use them to, to maximum effect. So those are, those are lessons I take uh, close to heart. Being that you have an economics background, how has that helped you, I guess, learn to manage budgets and uh, work with different people at this university regarding that topic? I, I, I think it's helped a lot. Uh, um, you know, if my former economics teachers were around, I would, I would thank them and tell them mm -hmm. that, you know, one of the things you learn about in economics is uh, the powerful concept of opportunity cost. You know, those of you who've studied economics remember this. Mm -hmm. So the concept of opportunity cost is that, you know, when you do something, there's also an implicit cost because you're not doing something else. You know, you're focusing resources and effort here, which means you're not doing mm -hmm. it over here. Okay. That's an opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. you've, you've chosen to do this, so there's an opportunity you've chosen not to pursue. And um, that's a challenging concept often in academic environments because the instinct in academic environments is to try to do everything. Mm -hmm. You know, let's do this, 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 this. No, if we choose this, we can't do that. If we choose that, we can't do the other. Right. And um, that's, a, that's a powerful concept that I think help frames good decisions because you have to set priorities mm -hmm. and say, well, we're going to do this and not that. So obviously. sitting here listening uh, to your definition of opportunity cost rings a bell. Um, I heard from uh, a little birdie that uh, you used to teach at Tulane yes. University. Yes. Um, so I uh, went online looking um, for uh, rate my professor comments um, from when you taught economics at Tulane University. And um, I saw a comment on rate my professors and it said, Professor Bernstein is awesome. He really knows how to make supply and demand sound sexy. <laughs> so I don't know if that rings a bell or if you've ever seen it. What have you done uh, in terms of your uh, teaching talent to, I guess, make it, like, how do you make that sound sexy? How do you sexy? make that sexy? Cause... Well, I'm laughing in part because you were money. I had a colleague at Tulane, uh, a very 
uh, a very fine psychologist, professor of psychology, mm -hmm. Michael Cunningham, who, you know, his rate, my professor comments were always off the chart right. positive. Um, but he would also always get the red chili pepper. Oh, right. You know, yeah. He was very popular with students, and he always used to say to me, he says, I don't care what the comments are, I just want my red chili pepper. <laughs> um, you know, in my experience, uh, students obviously, you know, want to be excited about material that they're learning in the classroom, and some subjects may or be more or less interesting to particular students at particular points in time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think students respond to instructors who are passionate about their subjects. And also, students want to know that you care about their learning. So if you can convey that to students, that you're interested in their learning, you're, you're concerned that they learn. One of the key issues there is being able to sense your audience. How are they doing? Are they bored? Are they happy? Right. Are they sad? What's going on out there? Mm -hmm. um, that can be hard to do, but if you can respond to that and adjust gee, this isn't getting through, or, mm -hmm. you know, I'm leaving them, I'm, you know, they're totally bored by this, then you can adjust and, and be more effective in the classroom. So I, I think that's always animated my teaching, because that's what I remember from my experience mm -hmm. in the classroom, right? The teachers I liked the most were the ones who were lifting me up with their own spirit and conveying to me their intense interest in what they were doing. Even though I, in the end, might say, well, mm -hmm. this was a great course in X, but I'm not going to pursue this anymore. Right. Were there any, like, um, I guess, tips that you've taught yourself to avoid the crickets chirping in the background <laughs> of your uh, your student audience? Um, I, I don't know if it's tricks. I mean, I think partly it's about being sensitive to your audience, you know, mm -hmm. sort of looking them in the eye and right. saying, what's going on here? Are, right. they, are their eyes open? <laughs> uh, that's a good starter. <laughs> If they're closed, they're that's a sign. That's something. a sign. Yeah. You know, maybe things aren't working out too well. <laughs> um, but also, you know, oftentimes just take a moment and pause and say, you know, does that make sense? Uh, do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. um, do you want to continue on this topic or not? What, what's going on out there? Right, right. Um, have patience with silence. Mm. That's that can be terrifying in front of a group. You ask a question. You know, can anyone tell me X? Mm -hmm. and there's nobody's raising their hands, the instinct is to try and fill that void with an answer. Because or, of an, an awkward nature, you know. It feels awkward, mm -hmm. right? But my mentor, this particular mentor said, just sit, just wait. Mm. You know, 30 seconds may seem like an hour to you, but it's only 30 seconds. Just wait. And that, things okay. will happen. Things will happen. It was great advice. Um, you ready to get to the third sauce? All right, let's try the third one. All right, so, this yeah. one is, what you want to read this one for us. Okay, this is... Uh, Louisiana style uh -huh. micro batch. It says it's batch 218. Pain is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one's got a little bit of a sting to Woo. it. A little bit of a bite yeah. to it. Um, so, no fooling around. Yeah, no, none at all. <laughs> this is straight business over here. Okay. So um, we're going to get to the next question. In the interim president role, so this is the, the big question of the day, <laughs> what is one thing that you'd want students to know about you personally that maybe, you know, the regular everyday student doesn't know about you? Huh. Well, maybe a couple of things, but I think the first thing that comes to mind, I am, I am the father of two daughters. Um, I have uh, two grown daughters, um, Eleanor and Claire, who um, mean so much to me. They're, they're wonderful human beings. Um, Eleanor, my older daughter, uh, is a director of marketing for a co-working firm in Los Angeles. Okay. Um, and my younger daughter, Claire, uh, aspires to be a playwright. Wow. She works in the independent theater scene in Chicago which also is to say she has a number of waitressing jobs and other gigs mm -hmm. to try and make ends meet, but she's, she's working on play scripts. She's thinking about possibly going back to school to get a Master of Fine Arts in playwriting. She's okay. thinking about that. But um, they're, they're special people, they're good people. So uh, that would be at the top of my list. Most, most students don't know that about me just because they don't know that about, about an interim president. Mm -hmm. Maybe the other thing I could share with students is um, Many, many years ago, when I was a student, I had experience working as a, an emergency medical technician trainee mm. with an ambulance company in okay. Hartford, Connecticut. Actually, 
that experience may have done more to convince me not to go to medical school than any other experience I ever had. Um, I have experience as a dinner cook trainee at a at a big hotel in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually a, it was actually a great job, and obviously I ate very well while mm -hmm. I was uh, training. But I didn't pursue a culinary career. And uh, finally, I suppose the other thing I'd share with students: um, I've always had a I mean, ever since I was a little boy, I've always had a fascination with airplanes and things okay. aviation. And uh, years and years ago, I thought, gee, I'd like to learn how to fly. I never had the time or the money to stick with it and mm -hmm. get a pilot's license, but I've, I've soloed an airplane three times wow. in the course of my training. So, I, right so that's cool, you yeah. know, a little single engine Cessna, you know, mm -hmm. flying around the airport, but mm -hmm. I got to do that. So that's really uh, interesting. Those are things I like to share with uh, students when they ask. So backtracking to the little, um, you know, odds and ends jobs that you've had um, and you being uh, interim president now and, and holding, you know, a high position at uh, this university and, you know, other universities as well. Backtracking to those odds and ends jobs, how has that taught you to, say, treat the janitor with the same oh. respect that you treat with the C CEO? Great question. Um, you know, I think when, you know, through your work experience, you learn a great deal mm -hmm. about interacting with others and, you know, where you fit in a large organization like, say, a hotel or... Uh, an ambulance company in my case, mm -hmm. any of us who have the privilege of serving have to understand that there would be no leadership position if it weren't for all the other people that are running the organization. And, um, you know, I, the analogy I often use is the organization's like a ship at sea. Uh, I may have the privilege of standing on the bridge, but it's all those people on the decks below who are running that ship. If mm -hmm. they're not there, that ship isn't going anywhere. It's going to go under. Yeah, it, yeah. Won't, it literally won't go anywhere. I try to hold on to those lessons in all the work I do and my current responsibilities and in the past responsibilities I have. Um, leadership is about serving others. Mm -hmm. It's not about having others serve you. That was a quote-worthy quote. I want to see that in the newspapers somewhere, so I like that one. So, uh, um, you want to read bomb. it for us? All right. Da-bomb. Da-bomb. Beyond insanity, it says. Um, ding, ding, ding. Yeah, I mean, right. it's a nice, uh, oh, <laughs> it's got the radioactivity uh, yeah. uh, uh, symbol on and it. When okay. you take a bite, you'll probably think it's radioactive. <laughs> okay. Right. All right, so we're going to take one bite, clink wings. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Whew. Yeah, that one's uh, Whoa. It's gross. You might want to wipe your lips, too. Um, got a lot of sauce on yep, that. Yep. Um, so, Whoa. right into the question now, let's talk about your Beyond the Expected podcast. That's mm. the name of it, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, so <clears throat> Deanie, who um, is the most low-profile pro person on this campus, has been producing it for you, so shout out to her. She yes. allows us to use this studio. Right. Um, and she showed me some episodes, and including the one that you did with the Hawkeye Pierce yes. of MASH. I'm a little bit of an old soul. I used to watch that show with my grandfather. Uh, Alan Alda, for those who don't know, what's the overall premise of that podcast and what was that experience like interviewing uh, Alan Alda? Well, let, we have to back up here. Mm -hmm. I didn't do the interview with Alan Alda. Oh. Alan Inkles did the interview mm. with Alan Alda because okay. I wasn't available. Okay. Um, but I can get at your question because I've interacted with Alan Alda a lot. I couldn't do the interview with Alan that day. I was somewhere. I don't know You're where. You're busy saving the world. Right? Uh, yeah, I was traveling somewhere. <laughs> um, Alan's extraordinary. Alan Alda is extraordinary. He's, he's warm. He's connected. He's smart. And he is passionate about communicating science. How do we find ways to more effectively communicate about science and what scientists do? Because he feels... So much misunderstanding today is about people being confused about science. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, he supports the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science right. here at Stony Brook. And he's a, he's a passionate patron of that mission. And I think he's making a real difference in that regard. I think I'm going to grab one of yeah, these celery go, sticks. Yeah, go right ahead. Because my mouth's on fire. You need some, <laughs> some blue cheese for that Let's one. Let's see if that works. All right, that'll help a little bit. Cool. 
cool off the palate. Woo! Um, talking uh, back, you know, on the uh, the podcast topic, mm, yeah. um, what made you so interested in starting a podcast? And I guess what's the overall premise of it? Nicholas Scabetta, who's mm -hmm. the vice president for marketing and communications at the university, first raised this with me, and we thought it would be a great opportunity to sort of drill in and highlight some of the extraordinary work a lot of our faculty are doing or people like Alan who are you know patrons of very special endeavors on the campus mm -hmm. and um, you know one of the best things about serving as a dean or as a provost or now I'm serving as interim president at the university is you get to talk to people about their work mm -hmm. I mean if I go up to somebody and ask them about their work they're usually willing to talk to me about it right and it's exciting to hear what they're working on. People are doing extraordinary things around here. Is there a, a favorite episode um, that you've had so far? Um, what is? You, have you done any anything like this before? Have you no. interviewed people and been an on-camera personality? I, I, I have done interviews. I've never done podcasts before. Mm. It's the first time I've had experience with podcasts, okay. which are they're fun because they're they're focused, they're short, uh -huh. you know, they're to the point. You know, we've done about three or four. I've done about three or four of them mm -hmm. so far. I think um, we've had a podcast that's focused on the work of some of our faculty on uh, vaccine technology and mm -hmm. vaccine um, vaccine policy. Because you know, obviously, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of opposition to vaccines. Mm -hmm. We have colleagues, some colleagues who are working with um, the Shinnecock Nation and some other indigenous communities to try and increase their participation in the census. Mm. And then I also had an opportunity to uh, interview some of our leading faculty who are working with our stroke units. I don't know if you've heard about this. We have Stony Brook Medicine right now has two special ambulances that are outfitted specifically to deal with stroke patients to be able to intervene immediately when they pick them up okay. to uh, clear these blockages. You know, a stroke is a blood clot that's interfering with blood flow. These are mobile units. You know, somebody calls us, I, I think someone in my home is having a stroke. We get this unit out there. They get this person, and then the telemetry is transmitted immediately to the oh, hospital. Wow. So there's a team okay. at the hospital looking at the imaging, can give direction to the medical team oh, okay. on the bus. That's groundbreaking. Yeah, and it can save lives. I mean, literally saves lives. People who would otherwise be compromised by these strokes even die from these strokes. Mm -hmm. And they're intervening right on the spot. So that was pretty exciting conversations. That's really cool to hear everything that you're doing for that podcast. So no, it's fun. thank you for including that. I enjoy that. doing it. All right, so you're ready to get to this last sauce. It's called Mad Dog 357. Have you had this one before or no? Oh, I've done all of them. You've yeah, done all of them, yeah, okay. Unfortunately, right. I have. <laughs> so, cheers to you. Cheers. There you go. Okay. All right, cheers, cheers. on that. Oof. Uh. Yeah, Ooh. That one's not. <clears throat> a, doesn't leave me a happy camper. Um, so, <laughs> I heard you're a Yankee wow. super fan. I am. I am. What is your most fond memory? As a fan of the Bronx Bombers, well, and uh, yeah, just fill us in about your experience. So, and I, I have to tell you a story about that. When I uh, was privileged to receive the offer to become Stony Brook's next provost, I was speaking with Sam Stanley, who was the president at the time, and I told Sam, I said, He's a Listen, hot takes alum as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> Live to tell the tale. I, I told him, I said, listen, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled, I'm all in. I'm ready to commit to you, but I want you to know that the only job I've ever really wanted was to play third base for the New York Yankees. And if they call me, I'm only giving you a week's notice. And Sam and Sam it. laughed and said, okay, understood. All right. A week's notice and you're out. I think for me and for many Yankee fans of my uh, vintage, game six of the 1977 World Series. Uh-oh. Reggie Jackson. Mr. I mean, you weren't even born. Mr. Um, Mr. October. October. There it is. All right. Reggie hit three home runs in that game. Fourth inning, the fifth inning, and the eighth inning. The Yankees won the game, won the series. Were you there? No. Okay, but you watched it. I was watching it on TV. Mm -hmm. Each of those home runs was hit on the first pitch. Three pitches, three home runs, three different pitchers. Oh, so he didn't know if it was the same ball that was coming to him. Okay. Three different pitchers, three pitches, three home runs. But that's all the more the impressive, biggest, though. 
Yeah, my mouth's on fire here. Same, Let me, same. Uh, I have one other aspect to this memory to share. Celery break. Mm. Woo. Nose running, mouth on fire. It stings. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm watching this game mm -hmm. in a bar in New Haven, Connecticut. Okay. The bar was packed. People are raving at this mm -hmm. game. Each time Reggie came up in the fourth, fifth, and eighth inning, I was there with my then college roommate. Uh -huh. Eddie said each time, I kid you not, he's going to hit a home run. So the first time he hit a home run, you know, we all went wild. I said, that's, that's great. Crazy. Eddie. The second time Eddie said, he's going to hit another one. I said, come on. You know, what are you talking about? He hit the second home run. We like made. When he came up the third time in the eighth inning, I remember, you know, Eddie just looked at me and said, yeah, he's going to hit another one. I said, you're nuts. And he, and he hit the third home run. I, 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 I mean, I like, made no, the hair stand up on the back of my neck. <laughs> so that's probably my most powerful memory. All right. Season. That's a good answer. Thank you for that. Last question before we end this. So, Michael Bernstein, long day at work. You're the interim president. Had a lot of meetings. You drive home. You sit in the chair. You put your feet up. <laughs> what are you turning on? to watch? What do you do in your spare time to unwind and relax? Well, you know, I like, uh, I mean, like to go to the movies, but nowadays, of course, with the streaming and mm. subscription services, really enjoy, you know, a lot of the Netflix series, excuse me, I get, um, I usually, I was, I was wrapped up in the Ray Donovan series on okay. Showtime, which Alan Alda was in in the last oh, season. Oh, all right, all I right. I would ask Alan questions every That's time I saw cool. him. Love those series. Uh, now uh, a new season of Homeland has started on Showtime. I'm totally caught up in that. Um, and on Netflix, I mean, I, there, there's a show called The Kaminsky Method, a hilarious uh, comedy that Alan Arkin and uh, Michael Douglas star in. I, Michael they've Douglas done two is great. Season, they've He's done great. two seasons. I watch it. You know, binge watch that. You know, I like to listen. I'm a, I'm a rock and roll fan. Um, Who's your go-to? To, so, I mean, I'm, I'm a traditionalist. I mean, I love the, you know, the Allman Brothers, Bruce Springsteen, you know, oh, Eric okay. Clapton. The Allman Brothers performed in uh, the Pritchard Gym in, I think, like, 71. Yep. First Tony Brook concert, yep. so that's pretty cool. Jimi Hendrix played here back in the 70s. The year before, He's another great hero of mine that I love listening to his uh, music. Actually, the year before he went and performed at Woodstock, he came in and performed here as well. Um, Janis Joplin... Uh, Pink yep. Floyd. I saw Janis Joplin in the Forest Hills Tennis Stadium when I was really? a youngster. She was amazing. And she was backed up that night by Johnny Winter, another favorite of mine. Uh -huh. He was the backup group for her. Okay. She was it the Brothers Band that he yeah, was a part of? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and that's, I, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, what would I like students to know about? And that's another thing. I was at Woodstock. I was there for a day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. Get out. <laughs> yeah. You're at Woodstock. Yeah, yeah. You know what's crazy? I, I talk to my friends, because I'm from upstate New York, Utica, so that's about an hour and a half, maybe two hours um, from me. So growing up, um, you know, Woodstock always really resonated with me. Like, wow, like I would really like to meet a person that went there. Um, so from what you're, uh, I guess, allowed to tell us, um, <laughs> what was your experience like there and... It, it was an amazing day. Literally, a group of us uh, drove. I mean, I was I was a youngster. My sister and her boyfriend drove us up there. They were older How old than we were. You? So I would have been what, you know, fifteen, something like that. Uh, You're probably the coolest fifteen year old ever. <laughs> and you know, my sister and boyfriend and a couple of other their friends. So we went up in this car. We were heading up Route 17. Yep. To get up toward. Max Yasger's farm, uh -huh. and the the state. This was the second day of the festival. Wow. The state police at that point had shut down the route. Said, Nobody's going into this town anymore. Right, right. The town was overrun. So we literally, they were letting people park their cars off on the shoulder, like in the middle of the road, kind of thing. Well, yeah. Okay. And they, you could walk in, and we were miles away. And I remember we walked. I mean, there was just a caravan of people. Is the is there any one specific act on that second day that you still can hear in your head? Joe Cocker, I can okay. hear it. I can hear him. Okay. Um, and um, I also remember we got we got caught in the rainstorm. You know, there's this big right. rainstorm that brews up, and right. everything just turned into a mud mess. And I, I remember that <laughs> it was a mess. 
it was a mess, but um, it's a happy memory and you feel like you're part of history. You know, uh, my only regret is we literally had purchased tickets, which we had, which of course were useless, but we never kept them. Uh, I can imagine how valuable they would be today I know, I know. at an antique show, right? right? right. But we did not appreciate the significance of that. Well, that's and they just disappeared. That's pretty cool to hear that it you is were cool. actually there. Yeah, I was there. I we was there. we appreciate you uh, <laughs> coming on here and sharing your story Thank here you. on Hot Takes. And Thank you. You took on the the Hot Takes gauntlet like a champ. Well, you know, I, uh, uh, I I can feel it, but these are amazing sauces. I do, you know, these guys, they're so hot that you can't taste anything. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But and the, it's like you know, it's like uh, uh, the combination. I would say like the yeah. the one two punch right here. Yeah, these two at the end. Whew. At but that point, your this mouth blueberry is not, one is uh, not a pretty bad. interesting sauce. Not bad. So thank you so much for Thanks, coming on here too. today. Enjoy we really it. appreciate it. Enjoy the conversation. To our viewers over at home watching this episode of USG Hot Takes with interim president Dr. Michael Bernstein. Thank you for watching. Follow us on Stony Brook USG Instagram and Facebook for more episodes, and we appreciate you watching. So, thank you. All right. Thank you. Some it's knuckles great. right there. Thank, thank you, you so much. I great. appreciate you doing this. Sure. You're watching USG Hot Takes, the hottest show on campus.